Last night at our, um, we have a Bible study in our home, uh, the old log cabin, uh, when the weather's good enough for people to be able to get up the driveway. Um, we had a Bible study last night in our home, and um, some guys came and they asked me a very important question. Uh, they're young believers, very zealous, and they said, you know, and if I do something out of just sheer obedience, but I don't feel anything, I'm not moved by love, I'm not moved by, by any sense of, of, of affection toward God, I'm just doing it because it's obedience, should I do it? And I said, absolutely, we are called to obey God. We are called to obey God. Um, regardless of our disposition, regardless of what we are feeling, we are called to walk in obedience. But um, we got talking and one of them said, you know, you need to put this on film. So, so here I am. I'm going to put it on film here for a few minutes. And I would like to talk to you, especially you young believers, about, about loving God and about obedience and how those two things go together. Now, first of all, let's talk about how do we grow in our love for God. You know, um, when I was a young believer, I, would, I was keenly aware of the fact that I needed to grow in my love for God. And my question was, how? You know? And I'm still aware of that. As long as we're walking here on this planet, we're going to have a need to, to, be, well, to be loving God. And um, when I was young, what we would do, you know, you would go to these meetings or go to revivals or go to some conference and, and it was all very excitable. You know, the preaching was very good. The music was very good. You were around other believers and it seemed like, you know, your love for God would, would increase, at least your zeal. But then after a couple of days, you know, after the conference is over, you find that you're kind of back in the same place. And I knew that wasn't right. But, you know, how do we grow in our love for God? I mean, in a biblical way, in a way that's really going to uh, remain. Well, I'd like to share that with you. And um, I find that Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, is very, very helpful in this matter. Let me just read it. Paul says, I, I urge you, brethren, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, do you see here, Paul is asking the greatest thing he could possibly ever ask of a person, to offer their life as a sacrifice. Not to another man, not to uh, the church or some ecclesiastical organization, but to offer their lives as a living sacrifice to God. Now, what, what could be strong enough to motivate a human being to literally give their life away, the most precious thing they possess, to give their life away for the sake of God, in the name of God. Well, Paul tells us here, actually, it's embedded here in this verse. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. He's urging them to give their life away by the mercies of God. Now, what are those mercies? Well, actually, Paul has spent the first 11 chapters in the book of Romans explaining what those mercies are. He starts off in Romans 1 through 3, generally, we can say that he's talking about the radical depravity of man, that we are sinners, that we are enemies of God, that we deserve God's wrath. But then he gets to, to 4 and 5, and, and he talks about the salvation, the mercies, of God in Jesus Christ, what God has done for us in the person and work of Christ, and how that is the greatest revelation of His love, of His mercy, of His grace. And then he goes on, and in chapters 6, 7, and 8, he tells us how to live the Christian life, even in the midst of struggling with sin, how to live the Christian life, and how we will come out of this thing victorious because of the One who's working in us this glorious and mighty God. And then he gets to chapters 9, 10, and 11, and he's talking about not just Israel. People misunderstand this, but the whole relationship between Israel and the Gentile nations and how God is evangelizing or doing a redemptive work in the whole planet with all peoples. And in the end, we come to the conclusion that he is a great and a faithful God. So what are we saying? 
how do we grow in our, in our devotion to God? How do we grow in our self-sacrifice? How do we grow in our love for God? The answer is, the more we discover about God and the attributes, the excellencies, the beauties of God that are revealed in the scriptures and, and particularly through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more we know who God is, the more our love will grow. Now let me explain to you how this works. Uh, the Bible teaches very, very clearly that a man is born with a, a heart that is turned against God. At best, it is cold as a stone. It's, it's like an inanimate thing in its relationship with God. It wants nothing to do with God and it does not respond to God, but it does respond to every sort of wicked stimuli. Well, that person, that unconverted, unregenerated person, the more they learn about the beauties, the excellencies of God, the more they'll hate him. That's what Romans 7 is about. The more God's nature is revealed to a sinful man through the revelation of the law, the more that man is going to kick against that law because he hates God, he hates God's righteousness, he hates God's holiness, and he hates God's law. But if you're a Christian, you're not that man. If you're a Christian, your heart has been regenerated. It's been made new and it has new affections. If you're truly a Christian, the more your heart learns about who God is, and especially what God has done for you in Christ, the more you learn that doctrine, the more you grasp that theological knowledge, what's going to happen is going to draw out of you your affections, and those affections are going to drive you to obedience. So, you know, j just think about it for a moment especially you young believers, how little believers actually study the attributes and works of God. How little preaching we hear on the attributes and works of God. Now I think we're beginning to understand why people, even God's people, are so um, dull in their love for God. Is there so little knowledge of God. We don't grow in our love for God. Well, let me put it this way. Imagine, I don't know if any of you studied physics, but let me just give you a little physics problem here. Let's say that I'm, I'm laying on the ground and flat on my back and you look over there and you see me laying on the ground and then you see me uh, grab a hold with two hands, my two hands. You see me grab my belt as I'm laying on the ground and I start pulling up fiercely, even violently on my belt. And you're kind of curious, so you walk over and you go, Brother Paul, uh, what, what are you doing? And I say, well, I'm trying to get up. And they go, what? I say, well, I'm trying to get up. I'm, I'm trying to get up. And you say, well, Brother Paul, have you ever studied physics? Because if you if you'd studied physics, you would know that in order to get up that way by pulling on your belt, you have to be acted upon by an outside force that has the strength to lift you off the ground. You can't lift yourself off the ground. It's the proverbial, you can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Do you see? That's what most believers are trying to do. They'll go to a conference or they'll read a book and they'll get all zealous and kind of like twisting up a wind up toy, you know? Just you go and you hear the wonderful music and all this thing and you just get so twisted up and wound up and the problem is though it just runs down really quick. It spins out and in a few days all the maybe even boasts you made about how much you love God seem to come to nothing, just poof, like that. What you need is something else. And, and this is going to shock some of you young believers. You're going to sit there and go, oh my, that can't be true. You, what you need is theology. You say, well, I don't want any of that theology stuff. Well, just listen to what you're saying when you say that. Theology comes from the Greek word theos, which means God and the Greek word logos, which is talking about a, a discourse or a word. When you say, I don't want any of that theology, Brother Paul, what you're saying is, I don't want to hear a word about God. I don't want to do a study about God. I don't want to listen to a discourse or read a discourse or dissertation on God. Well, if that's true about you, you've got a really big problem. Because if you know God as a Christian, 
and you're going to want to know more about him. And that's what theology is about. You know, sometimes young Christian, I hear people say this. You know, they'll tell new believers, you know, when you're reading the Bible, you know, after you read a passage, ask yourself, what is this saying about about you? What is this saying about you and what you need to do and who you are? That's the first thing you need to think about. No, it's not. That's not the first thing you need to think about at all. Matter of fact, that's the last thing you need to think about. When you read the Bible, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, what is this saying about God? What is it revealing to me about who God is? That's what's important. Because honestly, if your heart has truly been regenerate, if the Spirit of God through the Spirit of God, you've been born again, then the more you know about God, and especially God as He's revealed in the cross of Christ, the more you know about Him, the more you're going to love Him. And that's why we, we grow in knowledge. We grow in grace. You know, I have spent so many years of my life um, running around the world preaching. And... I'm getting older and people say, you know, but your zeal seems to just keep growing. How is that? Well, it's not because uh, I have some special gift. It's because I study God. I want to know who this person is because the more I see of him, the more I want to be like him, the more I want to trust him. Uh, the more I want to glorify Him, speak of Him. You see, one of the greatest problems that can happen is when a people, when they are ignorant of God, in the absence of a true knowledge of God, you'll always fill in the gaps with something false, with something false. So my encouragement to you, if you want to grow in the love of God, what should you do? Study the scriptures and study the scriptures, not to find these life principles to give you your best life now. Study the scriptures in order to know this person who created you and redeemed you and loves you. His excellencies know no bounds, his beauties, his powers. You know, when, when we get to heaven, I, I hear a lot of people, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. Uh, why? Why? You want to walk down streets of gold? You want to swing on gates of pearl? I mean, you only do that for a few months, I would imagine, and become kind of boring. What makes heaven heaven? Heaven is heaven because there is an infinite beauty there that cannot be exhausted. And I'm not talking about heaven as a creation. I'm talking about the creator who made it. You see, Everything is finite. Everything has an end to it. You can search it out to the final point and then there's nothing more to know. But with regard to God, that's different. He is infinite. So throughout eternity, we will be tracking down, tracing these excellencies of his attributes and works, these beauties, these graces. And at the end of a thousand eternities, we'll never reach the end because there is no end. That's the beauty of heaven. It's the revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So what is my encouragement to you? If you want to be obedient and obedient for the sake of your love for God and his love for you, then where do you start? You start in the scriptures and you start by studying who God is is. Who is he? Who is he? Now, having said that, someone asked me, they said, well, Brother Paul, is there ever times when you don't feel like anything and you obey? And I say, yes. As a matter of fact, it's quite frequent. You know, um, for many, many years, I've lived my life with a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And sometimes when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is grimace. And then I, I think about how I'm going to get out of bed with the least amount of pain. And uh, sometimes it's, it's even nauseating. It's, it's not very fun. 
And uh, then I think about all I need to do in the mission, the emails to answer, the uh, missionaries to speak with, the, the things to write and prepare, the problems to solve, and, and everything after, after not 10 years or 20 years, but more than 30 years of doing the same thing. And sometimes I don't feel like anything. I, I get out of bed, sometimes I, there's no sense, consciousness of the presence of God. Sometimes you get out of bed and you just, you're just tired. But you get out of bed. Why? Because it's not feeling. It's what you know. You know that He's worthy. And you know that He is. And you know that He is faithful. So whether you feel anything or not, you know that you need to get up. You need to study the Scriptures. You need to obey the scriptures and you need to keep walking. And it's in those times, I believe, it's in those times when I feel like nothing. It's just darkness everywhere. And yet I walk in obedience. I feel like in those times I am glorifying God more than in those mountaintop experiences because what I'm doing, I'm doing purely by faith, by faith in how trustworthy he is. There's a passage of scripture that a lot of young believers uh, probably never even read, but it is very, very powerful. And I want to read it to you to bring this, uh, this short admonition that has gotten a lot more lengthy than I supposed it would. Um, I, I want to read it to you before I bring this to a close. And he says this, it's in Isaiah chapter 50. He says, verse 10, Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant? Now listen, listen to what it says, young believer, that walks in darkness and has no light. He's not seeing anything. He's not feeling anything. Goes on and says, let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. You see, when you know God, you don't have to feel anything. You don't have to feel anything from above and you don't have to feel anything from within. Oh, those feelings will come. There will be times of great affection. There will be senses of of his love for you and all those things. And they're marvelous and wonderful. And I wouldn't take away from them at all. But there are also going to be times when we see this in verse 10. Darkness and no light. And what are we to do? We're to trust in the name of the Lord. We're to trust in what we know about God. And and so many people talking about faith today and talking about trust, but I really have to doubt many of the things they're saying. Because when I ask them about who God is, and I I ask them to tell me what they believe about who God is, they have almost no answer. And yet, it's impossible to have a biblical faith apart from a biblical knowledge of who God is and what God has promised, you see. So when we know that from the study of the scriptures, then we can walk in darkness. We can walk when there is no light, when there is no feeling, and we can be pleasing and honoring to God. Now look at the warning he gives. Behold, all of you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourself with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Now, Indirectly, we can apply this this way. There are some people who are just not content with faith in the Word of God and sometimes walking in darkness with no feeling and no sense of light. Now, they can't, they can't function that way. So they have to have something. So if there is no light from God at that moment, they'll fake one. Artificial light, artificial fire, false fire. That's not something that you want to do. Don't live your life jumping from one experience to another. Don't live your life going to maybe church services or conferences or camp meetings where some preacher gets you all fired up and then you walk in that for a while and then you fall again. Don't do that. Don't make some artificial fire and then walk in the light of your fire. Instead, live your life studying the Word of God. Live your life in prayer. Live your life seeking out not merely principles from the Word of God, 
but the God of the Word. Get to know who He is, and then you'll be able to walk. And yes, yes, there will be times of great emotion, of great awareness of God's presence. There will be those times, and they're wonderful. And you should obey God in the midst of those times. But there are also going to be times of testing where everything is pulled back and it seems like you're left all alone. In those times, you can glorify God more than in, than in any mountaintop experience. And so as a new believer, and that's who I'm trying to give this to, please study the Word. Start in Genesis, read to Revelation, then do it over and over and over again and devote yourself to prayer. Not just intercession for needs or for friends or for the mission field, but just communion. Walking with God and you'll do well. Well, I hope that was helpful to you and God bless.